After a really rough start to this season, rougher than I could have ever imagined, the Fresh Tracks crew is on a roll. And to keep things rolling, I'm back in one of the most hunter-friendly spots you can find, Gunnison, Colorado. My old hunting buddy Mark Hervinen, a Wyoming antelope slayer, is back with me for another adventure, this time chasing elk and mule deer in the Colorado Rockies. Gunnison, Colorado, Mark. This is about as close to the epicenter of western big game hunting as you can get. Everything here is welcome hunter, welcome hunter. It's cool. Our kind of place. Definitely. If you can, someday you need to come to Gunnison, Colorado if you're a hunter. We're talking everything and anything the traveling non-resident hunter wants right here. And when you leave Gunnison, Lots of public land, lots of elk, lots of deer. What more could you ask for? Other than to have one with my tag on it already. There are communities throughout the Rockies where hunters, both resident and non-resident, are like a second harvest season for the local economy. Gunnison is one of those places, and the entire community goes all out to help the traveling hunter feel welcome and to be successful. This is, yeah, this is all public land. Yeah. Colorado Parks and Wildlife also knows the importance of hunters to local economies and provides some of the best resources available. My favorite is the Hunter's Atlas on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife website. You can find every game unit, the boundaries, land ownership information, winter and summer ranges for deer and elk, including the migration corridors. It's an incredible resource that Colorado provides to the resident and non-resident hunter. Right now we're at the Gunnison Parks and Wildlife Office buying our licenses. You can buy these over-the-counter licenses. I think there's 92 units that are open for second and third season. If you show up after the season is already open, you have to buy it here at a division office. If you show up before season opens, you can buy it online or you can buy it at any license vendor. So we're here buying some tags and going to be hunting in the morning. I, I put you through the same thing as I do. Probably the greatest gift that Colorado has for hunters is their second and third season over-the-counter bull elk hunts. There are 92, I think, 90-some units in Colorado that you can come and for the second and third seasons, the rifle season, you can just buy over-the-counter a bull elk tag. So if you didn't draw in some place that you have dreams that someday you get to hunt and you still want to go elk hunting, Colorado is your place. I think we're going to be set. You got an over-the-counter bull tag, I got a cow tag for our unit, and I got a buck deer tag. The employees at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we stopped in the Gunnison office and they were extremely helpful. They're, they're biologists, they're wardens, they're staff people. I mean, they spent so much time with us answering questions. I'm sure they're thinking, this guy does a TV show and he's got this many questions? But really, I wanted to know more about the elk herd. I wanted to know more about the deer herd. I wanted to know what had happened in the first season, what had happened in the second season. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, we'll need all the luck we can get. We're licensed up and full of fresh information. And now, it's time for that last second stop for some gear. No problem in Gunnison. Now this is the kind of sporting goods store you need to come to. These kind of places in like Gunnison, Colorado, they have lots of stuff, they have what you need, and they have the good stuff. This is cool. I could spend most of the morning in here. When the hunt is over and successful, the good folks at Gunnison can take care of you then, too. Product of USA, there you go. From processing and packaging your meat, caring for your trophy. You would supply the boxes that are insulated and everything that we could buy from you to pack the meat in. Right down to shipping the whole works back home for you. We can pick it up from the processor, keep it frozen, and then uh, package it. Okay. Uh, ship it out to them. But once we leave Gunnison, it's on our shoulders. And it's time to load our packs and see if we can find some animals. You get on these shaded sides and there's plenty of green grass in here for elk. The Fresh Tracks crew is in western Colorado on the hunt for elk and mule deer. With the season already in full swing, we've missed our chance for any preseason scouting. 
So Mark and I spend the first two days getting a feel for the terrain and trying to learn some of the animal patterns. So we split up, thinking we can cover more ground. I just left Mark here. I'm gonna make a big loop. I'm gonna go south of him and east of him. And I'm gonna just be the bird dog going through all the thick oaks, hopefully bumping stuff this way. While I bust through oaks, Mark sticks to the high ground, glassing for the first animals to migrate through. Neither of us find much to report, though everything looks right. You get on these shaded sides and there's plenty of green grass in here for elk. It's not lack of feed, that's for sure. I think they need water because it's a really dry air. Well, crawled in here through all these oaks. I wanted to check out this water hole that it showed on Google Earth. It's not even a mud hole anymore. After striking out in our first spot, we move up the mountain and check out the big aspen benches. Again, we split up to cover as much ground as possible. Day one comes to a close, and while we saw plenty of two-legged animals, the four-legged beasts eluded us. Back at the hotel, I scour satellite images, map chips, any data I can get my hands on. But I'm already worried it won't be enough. After a second fruitless day hiking the Colorado Rockies, Mark Hervenin and I have only figured out where the elk and deer are not. So it's time for a new morning tactic. Rather than go higher, we're going lower. We're driving up to the trailhead where we're gonna start hiking. And there's this really nice three by four buck standing at the trailhead, chasing some does. And the camera guys are like, Randy, go shoot that buck. Come on, let's go, let's go. I'm like, I'm not gonna shoot a buck right here by the truck. I left, I dropped off the bench. There's kind of this big sage basin that I could see some deer out there and some running and scrambling, trying to get down there before the deer get to the private. These ones are on private. I gotta get over here and intercept these ones that haven't got there yet. Damn it. My hesitation allowed these bucks to slip to the safety of private, but at least I've got a pattern. Still, our top priority is getting Mark his first bull, and with weather moving in, 
we head for higher ground in hopes the elk will start moving down. So we're, we're up at, I think my GPS said we'd driven up to 10,200 feet and we got to this trailhead and we're gonna hike and we're gonna glass, but how are we gonna glass anything? If they came across the parking tra the trailhead parking lot here, I guess we could glass them. That's how we rode hunting Upper Michigan. <laughs> so what are we gonna do? I think we're gonna have to drop down low. Well, we gotta be lower than this or we're gonna be here a long time. Where is the road? This is a bummer, Mark. In what way? <laughs> In what way, huh? But since we've committed to this ridge for this evening, we can't do much else other than glass here. And We're standing up on this ridge, and the wind is just screaming and blowing the snow. And I look and I can just make out some does moving through the cedars a couple hundred yards away off the ridge there. And I told Mark, I said, you stay here. I'm going to go sneak and see if there's something, you know, is there a buck with those does or what's the deal? I must have went back down that side. I went here to try to cut them off. And I either went straight away or down that side. We've been from the low desert to the high country blizzard, and we still haven't fired a shot. But finally, I've got a plan. If they feed into the wind tonight, they're going to be up in this basin somewhere in the morning. They're going to get shot. It's our final day in Colorado. While Mark heads high to look for migrating elk, I'm back where I left the mule deer the night before. Coming in this morning in the dark, there were deer coming up these ridges, so. There's a little forky buck over there. I could shoot him from right here, but I don't need to kill anything that bad. Okay, we're going to put one right away. My biggest worry is that somebody drives along that AT. This is turned into a zoo this morning. There's a truck here. There's two hunters over here. That nice buck was standing right on that bench. Those hunters must have been following him. Two does and that buck just hauled it out of here. Oh well. It's part of the gig that comes with hunting public land. In the bigger picture, other hunters are a good thing. The more people who love to hunt, the brighter our future. So rather than curse my bad luck, I light my fire and settle in to wait them out. And they're on public. And when they get up and they start feeding around a little bit this afternoon, I'm gonna kill them. For me, when I'm up on these cold, cold days, high up in elevation, Maybe the wind's getting to me. I find some place out of the wind and I build a little fire like this. And not only does it warm me up, gives you something to do, kind of gives you this comforting feeling. This is my little creation in the cedars here. By late afternoon, my wait is over and it's time to move in on the buck with the tall back forks. After snuffing out every single ember, I ease down the slope to an ambush position. Smells like a buck is gonna get shot. That's what it smells like. He's right out in the middle of Buck Primate. Now he's running. He's running right over the direction I was at before. What are the odds of that? I just came off that ridge, made a big loop to get downwind. And now he's walking right up to the ridge where I came from. 
It just came back to pop like that. With less than an hour remaining in my Colorado hunt, it's a mad dash to loop in front of this rutting buck. All I can do is guess on a point of interception and run ahead in hopes to cut him off. He's up there. went pancake. I can't tell you how big he is. We're sitting here watching all these does pass down a little forky, pass down a three by three that went over there. And all of a sudden out of the back of the trees comes another buck and at lower light, all I could tell is he was bigger bodied. He was doing this stuff. I can't tell you if he's huge, if he's good or what, but he's down. He's laying there, deader than disco right now. <sighs> Those of you watching this are probably saying, man, do you always have to work that hard to have success? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. On this hunt here in Colorado, I'm glad I worked as hard as I did because if I hadn't, this deer tag would have went home in my pocket instead of wrapped around the antlers of that buck I shot. Well, he's not huge, but I really, when he came through those trees, all I saw was this side angle, and I thought this was the back fork. And I thought he had a beam coming out, but nothing you can do now. Thank you, Mr. Buck. Thank you, thank you. This is how most of our episodes end. Headlamps, backpacks full of meat, antlers, last evening, packing them off the mountain. <laughs> I don't know why Colorado would be any different. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Success never comes easy and it surely didn't on this hunt. I'm disappointed Mark didn't find an elk, but hey, that's why we call it hunting. And as we trek through the darkness, my mind is thinking about the next set of fresh tracks, more November mule deer tracks, this time in my home state of Montana.